going back into the book of James today because I really want to finish that. It's been broken up a couple of times because of holidays and all that stuff. But page 1198 in the Pew Bible, if you'd like to read along, it'd be great. Before we read, let, let us pray. Father, your word to us says that the word of God is living and active, and it is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. And nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So Lord, dear God and Heavenly Father, who gave his only Son for us that we might live to God. Lord, give us ears to hear. <clears throat> give us hearts that are soft and give us a suppleness within our souls to receive that which you are speaking today. And Spirit, speak loudly to us. I lift myself up to you and ask you to use me according to your purpose and plan for this church. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> We're in chapter five of in the book of James. And so as I, uh, beginning at verse one, well, as I read this, I went, I really don't want to finish the book of James. His words are so strong. Thank you, brother, for writing these things. So verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and your silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who are not opposing you. How do I take that and give it to you? That's the question. Well, the answer to that is why did James write these words? <clears throat> and the fact is pretty well understood among people who study the word of God that he was not addressing this portion of the letter to believers, but to unbelievers amongst them. And he was making a point about wealth and the use of wealth and what it is meant for and what it is not meant for. That it, is, it can be good or it can be bad. It can eat your soul. And he was saying this to the unbelievers that had come into the church who had attended meetings, who these people were affiliated with, the Christians were affiliated with these wealthy people, and people in this time period, in this place that he was writing to these Christians, got their wealth either by being a part of the hierarchy or aristocracy of the time, they inherited their wealth, or they got it because they used their land well. And they cheated. They hired people to work for them in their fields, to harvest their crops, to mow their fields, and then they shortchanged them at the end of the day. 
And these people that were being affected by this greed were people in their midst. They lived day to day. They earned their money. They stopped at the market. They got supper and they went home. If they didn't get paid enough, their family didn't eat like they needed to. If they weren't treated fairly, they didn't get their due. And this is what he is addressing. This is how you accumulate wealth? That is evil. You shortchange someone? That's why he says at the end, in verse 6, you have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. That idea of murdering comes from the fact that if you shorted somebody and they couldn't afford to buy the food that they needed to live, it's the same as murdering a person. A deadly sin. And the reason he's writing these words in the midst of this letter is because he is protecting his flock from this ideology. Because if you remember from earlier on in the letter, they welcomed, they cajoled, they flattered, um, they showed favoritism to the wealthy in their midst. You come up to the front, you take the best seat. You are one whom we will um, pour prestige upon because of your wealth. James said, no, 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 no. This is not what God's people are to be. God does not work within the limits, the rules, the guidelines, the standards of the world's economy. No, he favors the poor. He favors the oppressed. He will vindicate them. And James is protecting his flock by, it, it, this is some of the harshest language, not only in this letter, but in the New Testament, saying, you're going to pay. You're going to die. You're going to burn in hell for this kind of behavior. Remember, he's talking to unbelievers, but he's doing so indirectly to Christians that they would understand the penalty or the ramifications of uh, affiliating with or incorporating these people with their value system into the church. They need to understand that God works a different way. He works miraculous ways in, the, in ways that we cannot fathom or understand. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. He's able to do abundantly beyond what we expect or what we can even ask for. He is inspiring them and guiding them into that understanding that God does not, in a, God is not in a box. He is not in a box of worldly values and worldly systems. And they are to be thinking about their relationship with people in the world in a different perspective, from a different view. I'm going to read other scriptures this morning that I've read before. But it's good because when you try to change a habit or you're changing the way a person thinks, there has to be an agreement in order for the change to take effect. I remember many years ago when I was the service director at Natick Ford and Dodge, I had about 20 mechanics that worked for me in this main service department. Well, I had an idea that was gonna make the place work much more efficiently. And so I came in over the weekend and I moved toolboxes and benches and, I, and they came in on Monday morning. Well, let me just say, we didn't get much work done that day. These boys were like racehorses and you give them their head and you can't get it back no matter how hard you pull. And so I had to, what a learning experience. And my friend George, who became my friend, he was one of the mechanics there, but he was also the leader 
of the mechanics, unnamed leader. And I ended up having to talk to George. And he says, you know, if you had come to me and said, this is what we needed to do, because it, the way things are, are, are inhibiting our ability to provide more, better service, work more efficiently. He said, I would be able to understand that. And this would not, this day would not have happened. You know, when you're calling people at 3.30 in the afternoon and saying, hey, I'm sorry we didn't get to your car today. Oh, you ever been in that situation? On the other end of the phone? How's it feel? Not good. Well, how does it feel to make the calls? <laughs> he knew what he was doing. He squeezed me good. But I learned a valuable lesson that I'll never forget. People don't change unless they agree there is a need to change. And so this is what he's doing with this, is he's, he's showing them this is what's going to happen when you trust in gold or silver. Because moths are going to eat it, rust is going to take it, and there ain't nothing you can do about it. But if you invest in God, in your relationship with God, let me read to you from Luke chapter 12. There's a beautiful ending to this um, that fits in nicely here. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus told the people a parable. He says, the ground of a certain rich man produced an abundance. So he thought to himself, what shall I do since I have nowhere to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store up all my grain and my goods. Then I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be required of you. Then who will own what you have accumulated? This is how it will be for anyone who stores up treasure for himself, but is not rich towards God. James wanted his people to understand that to be rich towards God was an investment of something that will never spoil or fade, that waits for us in the future by faith. And it, it is immeasurable what God has for us, the blessings that come from investing that. He went on later in Luke 12, and he said, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father is pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide yourselves with purses that will not wear out. An inexhaustible treasure in heaven, where no thief approaches and no moths destroy. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Investing in a richness towards God comes from our hearts, and it provides us a benefit that is inexhaustible, a treasure that is inexhaustible. Now, looking around here and seeing the people here, so you find a person who comes to you and says, um, I need $5,000, or you become aware of a need that you can do, you could do, how hard is it to part with that five grand? To close out that certificate of deposit, and to invest in a richness towards God. If you believe that God has put you in that situation, has given you the means and ability to do it, you have to make a willful decision to do that. That's, that's, the, that's the tough part. Ooh, that's the tough part. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the word says, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, 
you will abound in every good work. Those words, good work, in the Greek come from a word, agathos. And the concept is, is that God inspires, God gives the opportunity, God provides the means, and he will bless it if you act upon it. And in Ephesians, it says that we were created in Christ to do good works that were prepared in advance for us to do before, the cre before creation, before the beginning of time. He saw in his heart what he has for me to do. He saw in his heart what he has for each of you to do. Some of those things may be very big and some of those things may be very small. But each according to what God has given him that he would bless from his heart. And this is what James is trying to cultivate in this group of dispersed Christians who are learning to uh, live and worship and fellowship in a new way. And he says, don't flatter, don't embrace the rich because they're rich. No. Embrace God and how he is at work in your midst. Whoa. That's a whole reset in your mind. But these people had to see the need for the change, and the need was shown in these hard, harsh words that he said about the future of those who embrace wealth, who it, it becomes the treasure of their hearts to want more and more and more wealth, and that's where their trust is. They trust in their gold and in their silver. I told Kathy yesterday, she says, so how's it going for you? I says, what did I say? Not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. Well, I'm, things change in a few hours, but uh, you know, I was living, I was, um, I got up the other day and the dog's dish, his water dish, in the warmer weather, there is like a little algae that grows in the bottom. And uh, so I had to take it and rinse it out and wash it. And I turned the water on and just let the water run. I mean, we have a well. We don't get a bill for it unless the pump breaks. But I let the water run and run and run and I'm cleaning and, and I just realized, wow, thank God for the water. I really thank you for the water. Wouldn't you know it? Like an hour later, as I'm going through and reading some devotional material that I get, there's some missionary-minded people who want to bring the gospel to certain places. And one guy described, he says, in Madagascar, we met a family of four living in a space smaller than many Americans' closets. And there was a second floor and a ladder led up to a second level where another family of five lived. Clean water was hard to come by. Thank you, God, for the water. We saw appalling volumes of trash and no toilets. We met a widow whose children had died and she lived in a hut with her chickens in an unbearable stench. Without knowing a loving Heavenly Father, hundreds of thousands of people have languished amid all this pain and hardship. However, God has begun to move. We are so blessed in beyond what we can even conceive, many of us, because we've never known anything any different. But things can change, and I believe things will change. You know how much I appreciate David Wilkerson's writings and messages from years gone by. Well, he wrote a book in the late 1990s, I believe, about how God would be with his people in the midst of the great changes that he saw coming. Now, he is a man with a prophetic gift, 
and I dwell upon this occasionally, the idea of a New Testament prophet. There are those who believe that God inspires people with words of prophecy, and you know what? I have come to understand in my relatively diligent search for the understanding of what a prophet is. A prophet is one who can see the inevitability of things to come based on the understanding that they have from the Word of God. When it says, if you sow to your flesh, you reap death and corruption. Well, when you sow certain things in a way in your own life, or in a country, or a culture, the prophet can see that there is an inevitability to what will result because of that. In Ecclesiastes 8.11, it said, when no punishment for crime is forthcoming, the people only think of evil all the time. That is a prophetic statement that says, if this happens, if you don't hold people accountable for their behavior, you know what's going to happen? They're going to want to do more and more bad stuff. And you're going to reap the benefit and the fruit of that. God cannot be mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. And so that's what James is trying to cultivate, is that understanding. If you sow into God's economy, into his opportunities, his plans, the things that he wants to accomplish through us, in corporately and individually, then you will receive more than you can ask for or imagine, more than you would have received if your heart was constricted and constrained with uh, intimacy with wealth and things and hoarding for self. Now at the end of chapter four, and this is a hard word. Remember I said James, at the very end of chapter four, verse 17, James redefines sin. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Is redefining. Sin is not breaking one of the Ten Commandments. Sin is you walk in the Spirit of God and you know that there's something you should do. The God has spoken to you through His Word and you ignore it. You put a shell around your heart and say, I, I'm not ready to go there, God. Been there and done that. I'm not pointing fingers and I'm not throwing darts. I'm saying it can be an easy thing to harden your heart. And the writer of Hebrews quoted the Old Testament said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in their time in the wilderness. Speaking of the Hebrews. And so that being said, that sin is for a Christian, for a person who seeks to do the right thing, and the word has spoken to you, and you know there's something that you should do, and that's not always just about money. More often than not, it's not about money. But to know it and not do it, that is sin to the believer. Because we reject God. And in Hebrews chapter 10, and I said this is a hard word, but we got to wrestle with it. If we de deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That, my friends, was written to believers, Christian people. A warning 
to be sensitive to the Spirit and to walk with the Spirit and to keep in step with the Spirit and to do the thing that you know in your heart is the right thing to do in the moment. And to not become a friend of the world to the point of it hardening your heart to receiving and responding to the Word of God. If God's grace is greater than all of my sin. And I know, standing here as an imperfect man who has wrestled with things in his life just as we all have, that he is faithful and I belong to him and that he would bless my heart with fear would be a great blessing that I would embrace fear of God and fear of what might come at the time that I stand before him to give account. He already knows where I'm at. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the marvelous throne of grace. And I ask you, Lord God, to touch our hearts right now and bless us with what you have spoken to each of us this day. And help us to rejoice in the fact that you still love us and that you will always love us. And all that you want for us is good. You have our best interests in mind in all things. And even when the word is hard, let our hearts be soft to receive and to be shaped and molded by you, the great creator, the great recreator. In Jesus' name I ask this and pray. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.